Please come. Okay, so please be very polite when you talk to me <laughs> because you are being recorded. <laughs> okay, how is everybody? Great. Today is Wednesday. Great. We're middle way. So wonderful. So let's get it started. I will do a little bit of uh, housekeeping uh, here. I will close the door so that I don't have so much uh, noise. Just a second. Okay, Selma did already for me, so that's great. And now we'll share the screen. And uh, let me see, can anyone in the group who attended last meeting or listened to the talks uh, can remind us what was the subject that we learned last week? Anyone uh, volunteers to give a sec uh, another seminar to give a, a recap? Well, we talked about um, like the different layers the different structures of a tree and how that ties into like the pulp fibers we're using mostly isn't it isn't it amazing svena that the layers that you see in the tree in a way also replicates at the fiber level when you think about the fiber level we also have layers of course they have different functions they are completely different in morphology but it's also a layer structure so it seems that in nature, layering is a very uh, common aspect uh, in the different organizations, right? So this is very cool. Anyway, so we can continue today a little bit. Uh, so that was a good introduction, Svena, thank you. It's about the morphology of wood, uh, the composition, uh, as well as uh, that of fibers. So we look into that, fiber morphology. And we also uh, discuss a little bit about the different pulping uh, processes that exist. So it was a very generic uh, uh, presentation. So today we continue this sort of training for the group, following up uh, the last part. And uh, maybe I can I can offer an additional um, little webinar uh, going deeper. If you are interested, just, just let me know at the end. But today I would like to continue talking more about refining, uh, also to look deeper into paper and the paper properties, at least uh, something about paper properties. So this is the, the plan for today. So um, I will start doing a little bit of a very generic recap about pulp and paper, because now we are shifting from wood to pulp and paper. And I found this uh, material in this website that you see in the bottom uh, left. Uh, maybe you can see the two sites, NA organization. These are people that I met uh, more than 10 years ago. Still, they are active in the web and is promoting the idea of, um, of a paper as a very nice material. And they are um, talking about the myth uh, about paper and the misconceptions about paper. And there are some examples here, right, about that. Notice there that in the top right, uh, they, they talk about um, most trees are used for uh, creating or producing lumber and solid wood products, really not paper. When it comes to paper, it actually is a part of the wood material that is used for that purpose. Um, the other thing that is also important to to clarify when we talk to people is that uh, many people think that, uh, uh, you know, making paper is bad for the forest and, and, and for the ecosystem. And notice here that uh, in the US in, and Canada, but that the same applies to many other countries, we grow more, more, more trees that we harvest every year. This is a fact. In Finland, I think the number is a 30% increase in biomass uh, in the given number of years uh, in the last uh, yeah, years. It's, it's an important increase in biomass. I don't remember the exact uh, timeline, but they're talking about not 1%, but uh, several digits. And, uh, and, and then you can see here, then from wood, it will go to uh, a, a pulp mill. And we review a little bit the different uh, processes to making pulp or to transforming the wood into fibers. We talk about mechanical pulping, chemical pulping, and we we'll, we we'll, we'll also review the different processes and nomenclature. It's very complex, and you have that in the in the video and in the slides. And then it's 
produced into uh, paper sheets, right? Or into, into a market pulp that is then sent to the paper mill and the paper mill is uh, produced, is, they produce paper. And when the two mills are separate, and then these are, uh, you know, two separate units, but many often times we talk about integrated mills. An integrated mill is one where pulp is produced in forms of bells or in, as a suspension and is sent directly to the paper mill. So that's an integrated mill where the two units are working together. So that's, that's the thing. So that's what we have. And uh, in, in, in that process, typically uh, notice here that in paper making, people know the formulation and what they do is they try to combine the best of properties of the different fibers. So we talk here about hardwood fibers and softwood fibers mid mix in a paper machine to produce paper. And uh, most of the hardwood pulp or fibers, as you remember, they are shorter in length. They have a smaller aspect ratio compared to softwood uh, fibers. And uh, softwood fibers, because of the length, they will produce better strength. So for that reason, you sort of mix the best of the two worlds. And in that way, you can make a better property for the given paper grade that is produced. But of course, there are many different paper grades. And, and depending on the application, then you can maybe shift this uh, makeup here that you have in the combination. The other area for uh, pulp making that is important is producing regenerated cellulose. Here I put viscose, but viscose is just a process. So pro probably I should have used here the word uh, dissolving pulp or regenerated cellulose production or for regenerated cellulose. And in this particular case, um, in, in the case of uh, 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 dissolving pulp, Usually people use hardwoods that are easier, easier to process and they do some uh, pretreatments to remove as much as possible uh, the hemicellulose in these dissolving grade pulps that are going to be used, for instance, in textiles or in uh, cellulose acetates and others. Um, the main thing or the main goal is to remove hemicelluloses that we talk about. And then the remaining is used in, in a pulp process where uh, this regenerated cellulose, or sorry, dissolving grade pulp is produced. Here we call it viscose pulp, but again, uh, the right word should be dissolving grade pulp for, for those applications. And if we go into more specific markets, uh, for instance, softwood pulp to produce fluff pulp, and that will be uh, for this type of application that you see on the bottom. So you see there are a diversity of uh, different paper and pulp products. And then when we talk about biorefineries, we can think also about the uh, bioenergy um, units where we, talk, we take wood, we do uh, uh, hydrolysis, refining, and then we apply enzymes in this so-called uh, biological or uh, platform or biochemical platform. Uh, where by fermentation and distillation, we can produce ethanol. And then also we have a residue that will be lignin. So this is a typical biorefinery process where the main goal is to produce, in this case, biofuels. But notice that in most of the bio and uh, biorefineries on the, this concept will produce a lot of lignin. And this is the reason why in the future, we say that uh, the future biorefineries will have a lot of uh, lignin streams available. So lignin <clears throat> is produced in pulp mills as, as we discussed in the previous lecture, but uh, usually that lignin is burned for uh, recovering energy. Therefore, um, it's not too typical that lignin is sold or is used for other purposes, it's just burned. But in most processes uh, in pulp, production, um, there is a limitation in the boilers, the capacity of the boilers. So uh, usually there is a small fraction, say 10% of lignin that can be used uh, for other purposes rather than burning. Uh, but anyhow, so that's a typical case, case of craft mills uh, and, and we have lignin avail available, but uh, if we think about the future biorefineries, that uh, amount of lignin that would be made available would be much, much larger. And for that reason, people now are putting more attention to the use, utilization of lignin. And then we have uh, the other component that goes beyond pulp making is paper recovery. And I have here the case of Europe. I, I, I took this from the statistics and, and notice that, uh, for instance, in Europe, um, a good 
a, a sizable volume of paper is recycled, 72% of paper is recycled. So as uh, in one of the previous slides, um, the uh, recovery of paper or recycling of paper is something that is beyond what we know about plastic recovery. In plastic recovery, maybe only 14% is uh, um, recovered, but from that amount, 4 2% goes really back to plastic. It's very little. But when it comes to fibers, the recovery is pretty large, it's 72%. We don't see that too much in North America and in Canada, where we use a lot of so-called virgin fibers. Um, but in other countries, uh, they use a lot of recycled paper. They take paper, they buy it, and they reprocess paper. And you can see here, that would be the number for Europe in, in the US or North America would be in the, in the order of 60%, 65%. So this is really a very interesting industry. So that's what we have here. And, and this is what I showed earlier, um, but I want to go uh, deeper into the pulp now. And this is more the technical part of the conversation. Uh, so let's go a little bit more on fibers. And I wanted to share with you a little bit more about um, uh, fiber properties and refining. And refining is critical. Uh, no paper can be made if we don't have the refining process. And that we can call pulp refining. There is also a little differentiation with another concept called beating. It's an older world word, but it's also used beating, pulp beating. So when you hear the two terms, they, they are more or less uh, uh, related to each other. And the typical beater or refiner that we see in the labs is this one in the left. It's a valley beater. This morning I put together some uh, uh, images that I will show next of uh, those type of beaters that are actually uh, very old in industry. They were the, the first methods to be used to produce a pulp. And again, this is taking the pulp to refine it, to get it ready to make paper because pulp as itself, uh, in itself is not going to be a, uh, a strong material to make paper. We need to refine and uh, refine it. And that's what we learned last, last time. I will recap a little bit, but this is very important to defibrillate the fibers. The other one is the PFI mill. PFI is an organization in Norway. So they designed this equipment here and you see this rotor. This is the rotor, this is the stator. And between the two, you put pulp, this rotates, and then that produces a defibrillation that we talked uh, last uh, webinar. The same happens here. This rotor that you see here will be shown here, but in a, with a horizontal axis. And the water with the fibers will be circulating in this direction, will be circulating. And this guy here, put into a horizontal way, the axis, then will be uh, producing friction between the fibers and the metal pieces as well between fibers. And fiber fiber friction is a very important in the refining and beating. We talk also about the disc refiner, and this is an example of a disc refiner, and also corner refiners. These are maybe we see less of those in, in the labs, but these are, of course, very often used in industry. And this tree on the left, we have in the pulp and paper center, we have three of those. And, and this is very convenient because we can use a small amount of fibers uh, to produce, uh, you know, samples to make paper, etc., and to test the different properties. So um, this is what I wanted to say about the old way of uh, uh, beating the fibers. So these are very similar to the uh, valley meter. I think that's a, um, uh, a design from, uh, from Holland. Uh, but here you see more or less the same in the old times. This is the rotor that I was talking, and this is another example, right? So very typical. And I want to bring this as a fun fact. Um, this is a picture I have used uh, some sometimes. Uh, this is me in 1987 in, in Spain, in a museum called Capellades, close to Barcelona. And you see this big thing here. This is a stone that really rotates and, and does that, that process of grinding fibers. And then there is a hammer here that really uh, uh, pushes the fibers against a solid surface in water and produces this effect of fibrillation. So this is what, what we have. And uh, on the right, uh, you see the evolution from the same process to what we know the Masuko grinder. It's a process similar to the disc refiner that I showed earlier with the same idea of um, fibrillating fibers to produce micro and nanocelluloses. But in this particular case, it's more like a larger scale. Um, I don't know if we have this in UBC, this type of uh, grinders. I think we have, 
but this is an example how we can produce uh, uh, nano and microcellulose. You know, as you can notice here, I tried to use the same pants and the same shirt after 30 years. This, this is when I was a student. Um, anyway, and, and this museum is here and, and notice that it's a very interesting fact that if you see the old uh, pulp and paper mills, they have houses that are multi-story and in the top, they have a lot of uh, windows. Can you guess why they have these windows? Well, the, the answer is very simple, uh, convection of air to dry the paper. So they produce paper in a very manual way or semi-manual. And then the paper was dried, not by applying thermal energy, but in this particular case, by using convection with air. Anyway, so refining is what you see here. For chemical pulps, we take the chemical pulps. Here you see uh, the different fibers, the lumen, the fiber cell wall, the they are pretty long in the case of chemical fibers. They form ribbons, so they flatten up. And here we have the pits that we review. And then after this process is that I just explained, we have the fibrillation. And this is an external fibrillation. Fibers come out from the primary and secondary wall, a wall of the fibers. And this is a process uh, that uh, we call refining of chemical fibers. In the case of uh, this uh, internal defibrillation, that's another process. So we talk about external fibrillation. This internal fibrillation between the layers of the fibers in the cell wall, they are um, deconstructed. They are more or less um, uh, separated. Uh, so they get swollen. And then uh, this is the type of thing that, that will happen inside the fibers during the beating and refining process. So it's very interesting. And if we think about the mechanical pulp that we also talk about, I show this slide again, but I think it's very important for us to put this into context. Uh, notice that the mechanical pulps are less clean than the chemical pulps. And this is for an obvious reason. In chemical pulps, we use chemistry to separate lignin and then um, obtain the fibers. But in mechanical pulp, what we do is more or less shearing or grinder, grinding. And in that way, we separate, we, we break the fibers, we produce a lot of fines that you can see here, and there is a lot of cutting between fibers. So the, the fibers are less uniform, so to say. So this is a case of a ground wood pulp. Uh, this is a pulp that is produced by a method that is very similar to this. It's, it's a stone that is rotating. Of course, it's not the old way with this type of stones, but advanced uh, composite materials that are used for grinding. And, and uh, that's the way it's produced. And then here we have the thermomechanical pulp that we saw in the pulp soap of nomenclature, um, where a steam is first applied to sort of uh, soften the uh, fibers in, in the wood chips or in the wood, uh, uh, you know, in the bulk of the wood. And, and then we have the process of separation, separating the fibers. And you see here the P, the primary wall is separated. There is a lot of fines formation. And those guys are defined as fines in paper. Uh, they come from mechanical, but as well as chemical pulps. These fines coming from the primary and secondary wall are defined as very small materials uh, and they are measured by a given procedure and define as uh, materials that are 70 microns or less in, in dimension. So uh, paper making fines. Anyway, here you can see a little bit of what happens. Uh, so there is a lot of fines, broken fibers. And notice here uh, the wall thickness uh, decreases. Of course, you are separating different walls. You are peeling off uh, the, the fibers. Conformation increases, the porosity increases, lumen the center, the hollow center collapses and peeling happens. So this is pretty much the effects of fibrillation and also refining. And this is shown here again. And as I was talking the other day with uh, Johan, uh, I think in, in paper, in advanced paper making, people are talking now a lot, not only about nano and microcelluloses, but actually fines engineering. How to use those fines that are produced from the primary wall and the secondary wall to to optimize um, the, the materials stream. And uh, some colleagues, for instance, in Vienna, in, uh, in, um, in grass, uh, they have very nice methods to take the pulps and the, fi the fines that are generated to try to separate them, to see if they can be reused in the paper making process. It's beautiful. So I want today to continue with uh, the different uh, functional tests that are made on pulp 
and these are including the kappa number to measure the amount of lignin. Cellulose viscosity is a way to measure the degree of polymerization of cellulose. So when you take uh, these fibers, you can dissolve the fibers, you can dissolve cellulose, and by measuring the viscosity, you get a feeling about the degree of polymerization of the cellulose. So the cellulose can be degraded by measuring the viscosity in a given solvent, typically cupretilene diamine. Uh, that viscosity relates to the degree of polymerization, how much the cellulose as a polymer inside the fiber has suffered. The other one that is the most important one that I want to talk a little bit more is drainability or the, the so-called the freeness. So I will be talking about this now. And then there are other things here uh, related to um, uh, cleanliness, uh, color and brightness, fiber um, classification, where we have, of course, a very polydispersed population of fibers, and then we separate those fibers in different fractions. Uh, web strength, rupture strength, retention value, web compressibility, and many others. So this is just some of the standards that we use. So let me talk about freeness. This is critically important because this to the paper making, give, make paper makers give them an idea how easy it is for them to use the fibers that they are buying or that they are using. And also for us, it's a way for, for, to measure the refining degree. It's not a direct correlation, but it's a very technical way to correlate. So this is a very interesting equipment. If you go to PPC, you will see it there against the wall. It looks like this. So uh, I hope maybe you have seen it. Uh, if you go back to the lab at some point, please take a look. Essentially, in the uh, in this standard that is a standard by TAPI, TAPI is uh, the sort of the organization that regulates the different um, methods that are used in pulp and paper. Uh, there is a, this method is a Canadian standard freeness. So yeah, very proud. This is a Canadian made uh, standard, and uh, the short words is CSF. CSF. So it's a way to measure the drainage. In, in, in short, we take a fiber suspension and we let the fiber suspension to filter through a screen. And then we measure how much water drains through that sort of a sheet or network of fibers that are deposited on the screen. So how fast that water drains tell us how well refined the pulp was. As you can imagine, a fiber that is looking like this will drain water more slowly. Why? Because we have a lot of surface area, a lot of fibrillation, surface fibrils and cellulose exposed to water. It will retain water and therefore water will go through the screen slower. This will drain water much faster. And believe it or not, this is critically important in the paper process, because in the paper processing, in, in the so-called Fordinier paper machine, that's in the initial name of these flat tables where they make paper, the Fordinier, in the paper machine anyhow, we use um, a screen or a, a, let's call it a filter that is running a very high velocity. And then in that filter or in that screen or, 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 or web, the water will will filter through and the fibers will be retained. So that filtration of water is very critical because if it is very slow, we need to slow down the speed of the process. So then that means the productivity goes down. At the same time, you want to have it because uh, the more refining, the better the bonding between fibers, as you can more or less uh, imagine in this type of network. Once you dry the material, they will make very strong paper. This will make less strong paper or, or non-wovens. So uh, for that reason, this is a very handy test to measure that drainability, how much the water, how fast the water drains. And this is what is explained here. So what I just told in, in words is maybe written here. Uh, but you can see here, one important thing that, it, that I need to say is that it's not only the degree of refining that affects that uh, drainability of water, it's the amount of fines. It's actually pretty important, uh, the effect of fines. The more the fines you have, the slower the drainage of water. And therefore, as you can also maybe conclude, if we use recycled fibers, paper that has been used once, we put it back into the process, that recycled paper contains more fines and that fine will produce a slower drainability. 
Um, and, and remember, the, um, the number of cycles or number of times a paper can be reused is about seven to nine in that part, uh, ballpark number. So a paper that you handle with your hands can be fibers that if you look at the history of the fibers, maybe it was used already seven, nine times before by some other people, right? So this is amazing. And the more you recycle fibers, the more fines are produced and therefore the is lower the drainability of water in this type of test. So you have to keep that in mind. Fines affect the test, but also the, the test is correlated or the results is correlated with the degree of refining because refining will also produce fines. Anyway, let me just explain this. And for this, I made an animation over Sunday uh, so that you see how this works. Uh, so essentially what we have is this, here we have it. This is a figure from my colleague, Martin Hube. I will talk a little bit more about him later. This is standard method. But anyway, here you have a, a sort of a vessel where you pour your fiber suspended in water and here there is a screen. Then uh, this is open, you close it, and then you open this uh, sort of uh, stopper here or lid that you have in the bottom. So that's essentially what you do. The fibers will be retained on the screen and water will be drained and it will go to this cone. And in this cone, the water will have only two options. It will go straight to the main vein, or if it is go very slow, then it will go to the side. So here is a trick. If this drains very fast, then this will be flooded very quickly. And therefore, most of the water will go to the sides. If this is, uh, drains very slowly, see if the water goes down very slowly, then the water will have more opportunity to go in the main exit here. So this is an amazing, very clever, I, I wonder who invented this, but that person was very, very smart. <laughs> um, it's a way for, for us to measure drainability and drainage of water. So the more refined, the slower the water will be drained, and therefore the more water will go this direction. So this is shown here. Again, we put one liter of the fiber in water, 0.3%. This is very well standardized. We close uh, uh, the top lid. We open the, the, the lid in the bottom. Water will drain as we open it. And, and then that drainage will be measured uh, as the volume of water that drains on the side uh, uh, tube here. And, um, and therefore, the CSF is measured in volume. We report milliliters. That's a very strange uh, measure, but this is what it is. So the volume that we collect. So uh, that's so interesting, right? So if we have water here only, no fibers, then the volume of uh, water from one liter that will be collected will be this amount here. So um, it will be very fast that goes here and it goes here. If you have fibers that are uh, on refined, like from soft woods, then um, large volume will be going this way again because of the reasons that I explained. Um, but as you refine more and more, this number will go will go down, and therefore the number correlates with the drainage. The larger the volume in milliliters here, shown CSF milliliters, the greater the volume, uh, the better the drainage. And therefore the refining is less. So when this number goes down, that means that the refining degree is increased or otherwise the amount of fines in the pulp is also higher. So please remember that uh, higher CSF, less refining. So it's an indirect or opposite relation. The larger the number, the less the refining, but the faster the drainage, which is what paper makers like. So, Think about this, the North Americans like to measure CSF because it gives an idea of how much water drains. The Europeans use a different concept, is this one, chopper regler uh, uh, Is it chopper regler de degrees? And uh, you know, in a nutshell, what they do is they don't measure the volume of the water that drains on the side, but here. <laughs> and therefore that number is now directly correlated to the refining degree or the amount of fines. The larger the number, the higher the, the, the refining degree or fibrillation degree. In the CSF, we're more focused on the drainage and therefore the number re relates to the drainage, but it's inverse to the refining. 
So I hope that you didn't get confused with this. So many words, but, uh, but I guess that you got the concept. Now, then what we do is that uh, we measure the degree of refining or the degree of uh, fibrillation. That can be measured actually by measuring the energy that is applied in the refining devices that I introduced earlier, or can be also measured by determining the, um, the Canadian standard freeness of the chopper rigglet, that is the drainability. And this is a refining curve. Refining curves is a curve where you, you see the evolution of given properties, um, for instance, mechanical properties, etc. Obviously here, when you apply more energy, therefore the freeness in CSF will go down. The more the refining, the more the energy you apply, the, the, the slower drain, uh, water will drain. Therefore the freeness will go down. The chopper regular will be the opposite. Um, but let's keep this as this is what we use in Canada. And then the mechanical properties can be also measured and correlated. Uh, so as you can see here, the tensile strength of the paper, once you make the paper will be increased uh, when you break the paper. Uh, the tear, that is this, uh, you know, uh, uh, this, this way that you take paper and, and then you do, what you do in tear strength is first you use a little blade to make an incision so that's the initial incision. And then with a machine in an automatic way, you measure this strength, this strength, the resistance to tear the paper. And that's the tear strength. Notice here that the tear strength goes down when you refine more. So the, the tensile strength, and that would be this property. When you, when you pull the paper on the sides and you try to pull it uh, in, the, in the in plane direction, that will go up because then you have better bonding. So that goes up, but the tear strength goes down. There is a little increase at the beginning and there are explanations for that. I'm not going to go over this, but then it goes down dramatically. And one reason is that the tear depends very highly on the fiber length. So guess what? If you make paper with nanocellulose or microcellulose, the tear strength is very poor. And the reason is, as you can imagine, because the fibrils or the units are very small. So uh, that's the reason. Okay, so um, let's now make paper. Uh, and, and here I have some, some um, uh, more information, but uh, now we're looking into a fiber that is refined and we put it together in a, one, in a two dimensional plane. This is paper. <coughs> and this is a corner of a paper sheet. One thing here that you notice already in this image, SEM image that you notice also here is that the fibers, of course, these are perfectly aligned, but it's not like this. But anyhow, the concept here is that the fibers are forming a layer structure. There are two concepts, layering and felting. Uh, paper is considered as a felted or layer structure where the fibers form layers. And you don't see in the in the plane. You don't see many fibers going in the out of plane direction. So that's the point that I'm making. And the second thing that this shows is that the, the, the fibers here are pretty stiff. That would be typical of mechanical fibers as, as we saw in the last webinar. Uh, and the lumen here is pretty uh, whole, it's, those, it's not collapsed. But with, with this refining and beating that we explained, we will favor this here in the bottom, that is the fibers collapses, the lumen collapses, and we have a more flexible ribbons or fibers making paper stronger and more dense. So you can imagine this that we discussed, in fact, and the density of this will be is, uh, lower than the density of this because of refining. So. If we go back to this curve, if I ask you what is the density here, uh, how is the evolution of density for a given amount of fibers when you refine more or when you apply more energy, the density will increase. Okay, and this is a case of soft food fibers, this beautiful image of the food, of the fibers, uh, the lumens have been completely collapsed. Sara loves this picture because she's looking into breathability in nature. And these are the pits. Uh, this is a communication channel between fibers. So you see all collapse. And this is another example now in cross section. So that was in plane. We were looking at the paper from top here in the cross section. So on the side, we're looking at the paper and you see the fibers fully collapse here. And this is the lumen. So this is a beautiful uh, image, right? 
And the fibers are randomly distributed in this case, uh, uh, but if you make this with a paper machine in a continuous process, the fibers will tend to be more oriented in one direction. Um, and I will talk a little, a little bit about that. Um, these are the hardwood fibers aspen, same thing. Notice that the diameter or the width of the fibers is smaller because you already learned that the width of hardwoods is, um, hardwood fibers typically is, uh, is smaller. They are smaller than the softwoods. And this is a case of eucalyptus. Again, shorter fibers as well, less uh, thick fibers. And the wall thickness will depend, of course, on many things that we have discussed in the last webinar. Um, so another example here, you notice here, this paper is really very badly refined or the fibers, you don't see too much fibrillation. So you can expect that these fibers put into paper will, will have low mechanical strength. And this is a cross section similar to what I showed earlier, but uh, maybe show some more details about this. So uh, if I ask you, if this was an exam, I can ask you, what is the CSF uh, for this uh, fiber? And, uh, maybe you can give me a number. So what do you think is the CSF for these uh, fibers uh, that are put in paper here? Can, can you give me a number? Anyone who wants to volunteer? Of course, you don't know. You don't have an answer because you haven't seen those numbers. But you notice here that I give some. So they, they tend to be in the 17, 700, 600 when they are not refined. But if you refine, they can go down to 30, 40 milliliters. So of course, my answer to, to a score the exam will be these are in the 600, 700. Right? It's a very poorly refined um, paper. And therefore the fibers here have suffered very, very little refining. So let's go to, to paper now. And I want to explain a little bit of this because uh, you know to get a general feeling. We agree that it's a, mostly a layer structure. There is not too much of a, um, felting, meaning fibers going out of plane. And they are formed using a screen uh, from water suspension. And this is a paper machine in, in a, you know, as a cartoon. Here we have the head box. The head box is where the fiber suspension is um, transported and laid down on top of the screen that is a running belt. So this is the screen and this running at very high speeds. So I was talking about hundreds of kilometers per hour, very fast process. Underneath of this screen, there are rolls that produce hydrodynamic suction so that water is uh, um, sucked uh, through, the, through the wire or the, the screen. We call this usually wire. And at some point later, uh, they put also suction boxes. So in those suction boxes, there is mechanical suction. So it's a gradual process. First, we use hydrodynamic uh, drainage of water, and then we use um, a vacuum to remove uh, uh, in a gradual manner water. And then uh, the, the fibers will be deposited on the screen, on, on the wire. And then it will go through a press section. In the press section here, we have two rows making a nip and therefore we press against each other and the, the paper will be then uh, uh, pressed and water will be removed further mechanically by pressure. One, two sections, and then it goes to a, a different section here that has a lot of cylinder, cylinders. This is called the dryer section. Here now we apply heat. So, this is very interesting evolution because uh, what you notice here is that water is first removed by filtration, then by pressure, and then by uh, thermal energy. Uh, if you try to dry paper just by filtration, uh, you cannot go too far. Uh, typically, this goes um, up to 20, 25% um, solids content. So this is a lot of water. After the press section here, maybe the amount of water is uh, 45%. And then after this, the amount of water in, in this structure is uh, maybe five, seven, 10%. So uh, the only way to optimize that process of water removal is by using first filtration, pressure, and then drying. <clears throat> this dryer is a, is a cylinder drying. In the case of tissue paper, that is a special paper, very lightweight. They use only a single cylinder, it's called Yankee. 
and it's a big cylinder that is used here, only a single one. And there are other processes where drying is used, uh, is, uh, is done by using air, uh, uh, flowing air through the paper, suspended and being transported, then air is going through, and then that's a different type of uh, drying process. But this is a typical in typical paper. So the different sections here is the wet end. The wet end is where everything is wet, the, uh, the press section and the dry section. We also have the so-called front side and the back side, uh, and the tending side where you can walk and, and, and check the process. Um, and finally, there is a uh, stack here of cylinders, and these are calendaring. In calendaring, you um, smooth the surface of the paper, and these are typically very well polished metal cylinders that help to, uh, to improve the structure of the paper. Then you have a three concepts that are very critical in what you do is the so-called the direction of the process. The process goes in this way, and therefore that's defined as a machine direction. And uh, fibers in the paper, if it is producing a paper machine, tend to be aligned in the direction of fabrication. That's why they is called machine direction. But some fibers are also located in the cross direction, and, and therefore not many, but some will be and this is the call, the so-called cross direction. This is beautiful in paper physics to see how we can measure the directionality of the fiber. So there is a lot of physics here. And there are many theories about, uh, you know, how to predetermine the directionality of, uh, of uh, paper. But what this means is that <clears throat> if you measure any mechanical property of paper, if you measure in this direction, it would be very different than in the cross direction. So the mechanical properties in the machine and the cross direction is different. TR strength that I showed, tensile strength would be completely different in these two uh, directions. Uh, and that's important for us to know. If you make uh, paper samples in the lab in a, a static manner where you use, you use a, 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 a cylinder where you filter the paper, they go down by gravity and then you filter the, the fibers, there is no direction there. There is no machine direction. There is no cross direction. So this is a paper that is fully isotropic. All the fibers are randomly oriented. Here, this paper is anisotropic, meaning it has an orientation. And then finally, we have the um, uh, out of plane direction. It's called C direction. And um, there is also an isotropy in this direction because this is a filtration process. Uh, many of the things, the fibers and many fillers that are added will be different in the bottom of the paper compared to the top of the paper. And uh, this is very cool. So if you look at, uh, for instance, uh, minerals that are added or polymers or even the fibers, the, the long fibers, the short fibers, the fines, they will tend to accumulate in different directions, in different planes. In, in the air side, so to say, uh, in the bottom or felt side. So this is the, 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 the wire or the felt side, and this is the air side on, on top. So that's what we have here. Notice that uh, we use the first, we use the fiber suspension. We pump these, these pumps are really huge pumps. They can be two meter high in big paper machines and they go to the head box and from this to the paper machine. And the amount of water that you have here is a huge. So these fibers are maybe 1%, 0.5%. So you can already think about it, but in paper machines, we use a lot of water. In other words, um, when I ask, uh, you know, what is the most important component in paper making? What is your answer? Water. Of course, you know the answer. It's not fibers, it's water. No, no water, no paper. Um, fiber, of course, makes a structure, but uh, water is critically important in the process. Okay. And this is what I said. This is clear. You see here machine direction, cross direction, and here you see the C direction in the cross section. And I said before, fines accumulate different on the different sides and the minerals that are added in paper are also accumulated in different sides of the paper sheet. Now, <clears throat> I will talk something that is very cool. Um, and for that, I'm using a ref two references that I wrote with my colleague, Martin Huby. He's the editor of the journal called Bio Resources. He's a very good friend. Uh, I like him very much. 
And this was one of my first papers when I became professor in North Carolina State University in 2004. So I have some papers before as a postdoc, but notice here, I started very late in academia as a professor in the university. So one of my first papers as a professor, and this reference is very cool. Uh, here we call this after talking with uh, Martin Huby, the paradox of paper making. And I want to show this because I think it's uh, very cool to discuss this way. Uh, paper makers are uh, bipolar people. They are a little bit kind of crazy. And I will show the paradox of making paper next. It's very important. So first, um, this is one thing that I wanted to go deeper into the paper making and to remind you that paper making is the same process as a long time ago. And this is a statue that I put uh, uh, here. This is like Sai Lun. Already we talked about it. And this is how he looks in a stamp in 62, but this is really the, the big guy for us, Sai Lun. And in paper, we have these seven paradoxes. So <clears throat> I will explain those first. Paradox number one, in paper, we, in paper making, we divide, we split the fibers to then recombine them. In other words, the paper making process is about breaking interfiber bonds in the fibers in wood or in the chips, in wood, right? To then separate, disperse them in a huge, huge amount of water to then put them again. So it's a paradoxical uh, aspect, right? Uh, but it's an important one that you need to think uh, because that really, if you think about this philosophy, then you can really think uh, how, how the process is and how you can optimize the variables in the production, right? So you first break the bonds and then you make bonds again. And the reason is that you have to use a structure that is a tube, it's a trunk to put in a, in a two dimensional uh, paper sheet. Um, so uh, these are things that you know about this, uh, length to thickness of uh, the fibers are 50 to 100, softwood, hardwoods that are the average values. And the long, the bigger this number, the bigger the bonding here in this structure. The formation is mostly in layering and the orientation is the machine direction. So I'm putting all together that I have explained. And a fun fact, fact here is that typical fiber in a paper crosses with 20 to 40 similar fibers. So a, a single fiber that you see in a paper structure usually talks usually is connected or crosses with 10, 20 to all the 40 uh, fibers. So that's, that's very cool. <clears throat> and um, those fibers, if you think about the fibrillation that I explained, are uh, on the surface fibrillated as you have seen in some of the um, uh, microscopy uh, figures or photos that I showed earlier. And in fact, this makes me think that in fact, uh, when we talk about nanocellulose, long time ago, since early on, those fibrils or those nanocelluloses are already there present. Uh, and it's interesting that, um, yeah, in paper making, we're using fibers, but nanotechnology has been there all along. It has been hidden, but it has been there. My, uh, my uh, PhD advisor, by the way, he was the one to measure those fibers on the top of fibers and he measured these distances. And for that, he used a technique called the surface force apparatus to measure the surface interaction forces. Very, very sophisticated approach to look into the molecular scale uh, interaction between materials, uh, interaction forces. And from, from that, he concluded this type of information that is very nice. Now, if we think about that and how those connect with each other here uh, at, at that larger scale, I need to refer to a very famous equation that allow us to explain paper properties. And this is a fellow, I think he passed away not too long ago in the UK, his last name is Page. And he has this equation, Page equation. And maybe we have short time to go deeper into this equation, but I think it can, it can be in a qualitative sense, a very handy, a tool for you. In this equation, what Page proposed, and this is by the way, a physicist. So paper making is a lot of physics, uh, it's Vena. Um, in, in this Page equation, <clears throat> we have the tensile index. Tensile index is a measure of the strength of paper. So the inverse of the textile index, the strength of paper relates to these variables. One is C, C is the zero span tensile strength. 
serous pantensile strength is the fiber strength, how strong a single fiber is. That can be measured. In fact, in the lab, that we can measure in PPC, in the pulp and paper center, is the strength of a fiber of the unit. And then the other, the other factors contributing to the strength include the RBA, the relative bonded area. So the more the bonding between the fibers, the more the strength, the higher the strength. So con two contributions stand out the strength of a single fiber and the strength of the bond or bonds between fibers. Then there are two other factors. Uh, is the strength of the bond itself, um, also the length of the fibers and the width of the fibers. So already here you notice that uh, the higher this ratio, the higher the strength. Of course, it's put in the inverse fashion. So if I reverse this equation, the strength of a paper will be proportional to the length divided by the width. Not exactly proportional, but at least correlates. So the higher the aspect ratio, the better the strength of the structure. This is known in composites. And especially here, what we're trying to do when we go to the forest is to produce trees that produce fibers that have higher aspect ratio that are longer and thinner. Cedar is very good for that. Cedar in Canada has a very high aspect ratio. That's, that's a special of cedar, cedar, cedar uh, fibers. So that's what we want. So from the morphological point of view that we reviewed in the last webinar, we want to increase this L over, over width. But from the, and this is not in the control of paper makers, right? I mean, of course, refining and cutting fibers will reduce this. So you can make a conclusion here. When you refine, you try to protect the fibers, not to cut the fibers. You refine them, you fibrillate them internally and externally, but you try not to cut the fibers. That's very critically important. So the higher this value, the better, the L over the width. This is in the control of the forester, but also the paper making when processing the fibers. What is probably even more in control of the paper making is the relative bonded area. Uh, you promote bonds and stronger bonds will get better strength. And then the fiber strength is also dictated by the forest, right? I mean, the, this depends on the type of uh, uh, tree and the type of uh, pulping process, chemical or mechanical. And we talk a little bit about that. That also depends on the coarseness of the fibers that we discussed and the width of the cell wall. So as you can see, this equation is very handy and is used very often. So this is an example of a paper where the fibers are crossing each other with a very high relative bonded area. You can predict here very high strength, right? Logically, this is a plain view. If you look at this, the RBA, as you can um, imagine, is lower. You see the fibers are less flat. The contact area between fibers in the crossings is less. So this is one fiber, this is another fiber, low contact area. So conclusion here, RBA is smaller Therefore, this value is smaller. Therefore, the tensile will be smaller. Uh, and, and that contact area can be actually measured by microscopy. These are like uh, image analysis of microscopy images at the crossing between fibers. So this is a fiber crossing, 100% RBA, full contact between the fibers. But if, if I go to this stream, it's only 25% uh, contact area, relative bonded area. And I can talk a lot about this, it's very important, but uh, RBA you can measure, in fact. One way to do this, and, and I, I, I tell this to all of you who are making paper these days, is that if you make paper with water as a solvent, then you will favor a lot of contact area. But if you take and replace uh, water by ethanol, you take ethanol, what do you think is the paper structure going to be and the paper strength? Can, can you guess if you use ethanol rather than water, what, what is going to happen when you make paper? Not that you want to do it because of course, why to use an organic solvent, right? More expensive than water, but just a fun, fun fact. If you use ethanol, the paper strength will be very small uh, for reasons that I probably will have a chance to explain later, but really water is critical here. So the second one, back to water, that's a good introduction to the second paradox. Add water and then take it away. This is amazing. And for that, for that, um, um, Martin and I decided to use a camel 
that accumulates a lot of water. So you take a, a fibers that are fully swollen, have a lot of uh, water in the tree, uh, but in a way they are wet. And then when you uh, produce paper, then you remove water. So first you take fibers from wood, put a lot of water. I indicated uh, 97, 99% in the process at the beginning is water, only a fraction is fibers. And then you remove the water. So can you imagine, I mean, this kind of dump, you take fibers, you put water and do, then you remove water. Why to do that? This is crazy. It's a paranoia. But the reason is that water is critical so that uh, fiber and fiber bonding is increased. And this is because something that, that is the, um, called surface tension. This is a picture that I took actually. This is a little bug sitting on water. And you see that this can be heavier per unit uh, volume than water, but it doesn't sink. And it doesn't sink because here it has some legs that are hydrophobic that avoids contact with water. And uh, that resistance of water to be broken for something to penetrate is what defines the surface tension. Uh, again, here we can talk a lot about surface tension. This is actually something that I did a lot uh, early on um, as far as the fundamentals of uh, surface tension. But what is important here in, in fiber and paper making is that when you take two fibers and you put water, that water will form because of surface tension forces will form this meniscus. And the more water you remove, the, mm, the closer will, five, will be the fibers to each other, the smaller the meniscus and the curvature of the meniscus here will become very, very important. And this curvature mathematically leads to something called Laplace forces. And you don't need to worry a little bit about that at this point if you're not interested. But my point here is that that pressure, that Laplace force here, uh, this uh, gap between the fibers is extremely high. So high that these fibers at given, a given distance, those fibers will be pulled together and they will bond. And this is because capillary forces. So capillary forces due to surface tension are important in paper making. Those capillary forces, I can go back to the process of paper making. Those capillary forces start to happen. Uh, here you remove a lot of water, but it's still very wet. Here you have still a lot of water, but in the dry section here, um, you have very little water, less, less water as you move to the right. And then this is where during the drying, where the capillary forces are the highest and the water that is being evaporated pulls the fibers together. And by surface tension, capillary forces, the fibers get closer to each other and then they develop bonding. And that bonding is very strong. It's hydrogen bonding. Okay, um, so that's why. Now, why we use so much water then at the beginning? Uh, of course, we use a lot of water, as you know, because we want to have uh, fibers that are suspended in water, very well dispersed, forming flocks. And this is what is going to happen in the paper machine that I showed earlier, when they are mixed with water, they are, you know, uh, dancing in water. And these are two fibers. And during the flow field uh, that is in the paper machine, of course, fibers will find the opportunity to, to find each other and to entangle. And that flocculation, we try to, um, to improve in the process. So if I go to the paper machine, that's called flocculation between fibers. That flocculation happened here in the, in, the, in the head box. We have a lot of water, fibers are starting to flocculate and they need to flocculate so that water drains faster. And that's a way to help the drainage and also for them to find each other and bond. So flocculation is important. But if this flocculation is not controlled, then we will be in trouble because then you will have a non-uniform. So this is a very sort of critical balance. You want to flocculate the fibers, but very uniformly. This is called microflocculation. And as it happens, and historically perspective, uh, in PPC, we have uh, some very good people in the past, uh, Dick Kerekes, who work a lot in this area of uh, uh, hydrodynamics of fibers. And he's around. So whenever, please, let's call him. It would be nice to chat with him. He's really a legend in this area. So in this flocculation, there's something called crowding factor. 
Halting factor notice depends on the length of the fibers and the diameter of the fibers. Once again, here we have the aspect ratio that we talk, and uh, the longer the fibers, the higher the crowding factor, therefore the higher the tendency to find the fibers each, to, to, for the fibers to find each other and to flocculate. And that is scales with the square. So it's a very important um, dependency there. And we are using this actually for nanocellulose. Uh, anyway, third paradox is very cool. Uh, Swell in water to then dehydrate again because of the drying. So we have fibers that are entire, they are not swollen, but during the refining, we do this sort of, uh, that you saw earlier, external defibrillation and internal defibrillation. Fibers become swollen in water, especially because of the internal fibrillation. And then that water that is inside, we remove it by drying. So another, uh, you know, bipolarity of paper makers, uh, they tend to make the fibers swollen and then they make the fibers to shrink. That's very cool. And, and uh, of course, what they will notice is that the more swollen the fibers at the beginning, once you remove the water, then you, you favor higher paper strength. Also having fibers that are more swollen will become more flexible. So it's actually at the end, not so crazy that we tend to make the fibers uh, swollen when we need, because they become more flexible, they flatten up and they increase the relative bonded area. And then, um, as a, as a, the other side of the coin, of course, the more they swollen the fibers, the more refined they are, of course, the more difficult it is to remove water. So going back to this process, uh, uh, that's a, the thing that we need to control, is that uh, you tend to refine fibers to, to make them uh, fibrillated and more swollen, but that also means, according to the CSF discussion that we have, the freeness, the dewatering will be slower, and that the water that is a slower will mean that here we need to apply either more cylinders or apply higher temperatures to dry. So this is all, you know, a trade-off effects. So being paper making means being a magician uh, to some extent. Okay, so that's what we have, we see there. And notice here one thing that, I, that you can measure that when the fibers get closer to each other, <coughs> in the nanoscale range, 50 nanometers or so, you generate forces that are huge, several atmospheres of forces. So this is huge, very important. Paradox number four, make fibers flexible to make paper stiff. Uh, you saw this, I think, in previous slides, when we have this situation, we don't want that. Paper will be not good quality. We want this, either non walls or textile, we want this. So we start with hollow, stiff fibers to make something that is flexible. But, but those flexible fibers is what makes the paper stiff. So it's a, a paradox there. So I, here I talk a little bit about that, but I hope this is obvious to you. Sorry that I'm breaking a little bit uh, with water, I need some water. Okay, paradox number five, disperse well everything, but retain, retain the uh, fine. So it's a, a schizophrenia in paper making uh, to have everything well dispersed, but at the same time, well adhere. This is a challenge. It's called retention, retention. You have to have fibers at the beginning of the paper making process that are very well dispersed, uniformly dispersed. We apply shear as you saw earlier, we even apply these persons to, to, for them to be very well um, dispersed, but then they need to flocculate to agglomerate so that they come into the running belt and find each other and make paper. And for that, we use polymers. And that will be what I will explain uh, later. So we use uh, polymer chemistry. Um, uh, so uh, this is uh, roughly what uh, we have. And those polymers that are added to increase the con contact between fibers and, and, and the, the students and researchers working with Maria are looking into those uh, paper strength additives. One typical one is to use um, um, starches, for instance, right? Or acrylamides. So uh, the case of acrylamide, polyacrylamides are very typically used in paper making. And they, what is unique about polyacrylamides is that they are very high uh, molecular mass uh, molecules. So they can be two mi 20 million uh, 
Gamper mode. So these molecules are very good because they can flock, they can put the fibers together. But you have to be doing this very carefully. If they flocculate too strongly, uh, you will have a lot of paper defects at the end. So again, this is a balance between dispersion, flocculation, and formation. Another one is uh, polyethylenemine uh, and polyamines uh, and starch. Uh, these are examples of things that papermakers use to control those processes. And as I will tell later, uh, we also use fillers. So let me just see. Okay, maybe it can run maybe uh, half an hour more or 15 minutes more. I don't remember how much we have time. We start at 9.30. Okay. I think originally it was supposed to be until 11. Right, okay, good. So 15 mi more minutes and, and then we stop. I, I want to really reach a point where you can really appreciate how the paper components all come together. So I, I think I'm reaching that, that point. Okay, paradox number five. Um, again, going back to that issue, and that's the fine uh, sort of thing that we need to control. Flocculate the fibers and then to disperse them. So we use, we have them well dispersed. We are high molecular mass flocculants like polyethylamides and others. Those fibers are flocculated and then they should be very well dispersed so that the fiber has a good formation. So in general, all this speaks to the fact that we want to add additives to retain materials, to retain the fines, to retain as much as possible of the fibers. And at the same time, that for that retention to be very, very uniform. And uh, this is uh, very critical. And for that, we use different polymers. Uh, this is an example, uh, high molecular weight polymers. And these are negative surfaces. Imagine this is uh, uh, fines in the paper making. All of those are negatively charged. So usually we use either neutral or cationic polymers and they can add by bridging mechanisms or by electrostatics. So this is a mechanism for, for all this to be pulled together in, in a paper sheet. Um, and maybe I can skip this, but uh, where those retention aids are added. So uh, this is a little bit more technical, but, uh, but maybe it's worthwhile uh, explaining very briefly. This is a paper machine, the head box. This is a running belt that I have explained. Water is draining. Before that, actually what you have is the fiber suspension coming to the system. This is the pump that pumps the whole thing full of water to the paper machine. It's called fan pump, F-A-N pump, fan pump. Huge pumps. It goes to a cleaners that, uh, that maybe separates unwanted material then the fibers or the accepted materials go to, go, goes to a silo or a tank. And sorry, this is the fan pump. I, I was mistaken. This is a, similar to a fan pump, but anyhow, this is the fan pump. And the fan pump goes to a screener where uh, things are separated as well. And then it goes to the head box. Uh, so again, huge volume of water. The amount of water that a single paper machine can manage can be the volume of a town, consumption of a town. Good news is that that water is mostly uh, uh, removed and either recycled. So these this cycles, these uh, um, um, water loops are very close. Uh, the losses of water are mainly by evaporation. And this is then uh, compensated by addition of extra water. But uh, in general, nowadays the paper machines operate with uh, not too much water. Everything is close. And then what I wanted to show here is where the retention aids are added. Those uh, flocculating um, polymers are added before the head box, just before, because if it is in other areas, maybe uh, you don't want to have flocculation here, but very close to the head box where there is a lot of uh, uh, shear and hydrodynamic forces. But you see how beautiful this is, right? And the fibers that are coming in here, you want to, for them to be retained here, not to drain here. So that's why we use retention aids to keep the fibers on the paper uh, because these screens are pre-open and many little fine particles can pass through and you don't want that. You want to retain as much fines and as small particles and as small fibers as, as possible in the paper. Other ways you are wasting uh, fiber material. Okay, um, I think this is uh, it. The other component is we use uh, fillers, um, uh, mineral particles, silica, bentonite, calcium carbonate, 
uh, clay, they are added in the process. Uh, these are additives that are used for different reasons. Uh, for instance, to increase the optical properties, to increase the opacity, um, we use those type of minerals. They will be called, maybe we can call them fillers. So the, those cationic polymers, what they do is they take the fiber surfaces and the fines and the small materials and the small fibers will be retained on the fibers. And for that, we use a lot of electrostatic um, effects uh, using, you know, um, opposite charge materials and trying to neutralize the charges. So for that reason, we use here cationic polymers. Uh, microparticles as well can be used for similar reasons. So those very small particles can be added and what they will do is they will more or less uh, 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 make a very strong uh, connection. They will drive the fine materials together with the fibers by electrostatics and very effective way to do it. There is a lot here, but of course I, I cannot uh, go in detail, but you see here the fact that uh, we use fillers and also microparticles. So nanotechnology has been used long time ago in paper making, in fact, before maybe uh, the word was invented. Okay, now let me just skip this. The last one is uh, <clears throat> you have fibers that are water wa waterborne uh, and you use a very water intensive paper, but you want to make paper water resistance. That's, that's the, the most terrible paradox that we have. And, and in the projects that we're running, we want to produce this type of situation. If we talk about face masks, or if we talk about uh, textile materials, we want to do this. Use water, but remove water, and then make paper water hating. And this is very hard, very hard because fibers are water loving. One typical way that people use in the old time was to use actually some um, molecules that are hydrophobicin molecules. Typical ones from wood are rosins, extractives, that are hydrophobic, water repellent. And for that in the old time, they use aluminum as a binder between the fiber surface and, and those uh, uh, sizing agents. These are called sizing agents to increase the hydrophobicity. So uh, that process is called sizing to make fibers or paper water hating. And this is a very typical process. Nowadays it's replaced by others. So nowadays we use uh, um, polymers to produce similar effect. But in a way, this is a paradox too, right? Something making, something water loving, water hating. In sizing, um, maybe you can remember these two names. I just put it here so that you start to remember those names. A typical sizing agents to produce this uh, water resistant are uh, the most typical ones are AKD and ASA. They are used industrially. They are, they are waxes that are used as an emulsions in the paper, paper making process. And I have been asking long to please, <clears throat> let's use nanocellulose for, for emulsifying uh, these, these waxes in paper making. We need to do that at some point. Anyway, so yeah, you see here, do you agree with me? Making paper is a miracle and requires uh, a little bit of uh, bipolarity or, um, people with uh, bipolar disorders like me. Anyway, let's, let's, let's look at, at the last stretch is maybe five more minutes that I will, 10 minutes that I will, I will drive here. It's a fact that in, in fibers, uh, uh, you saw here we have wood, but we can have other resources. We can have chemical treatment and mechanical fibers, but there are also fibers that we have been discussing and, and with Johan, we have been talking, you know, about making also use of uh, glass fibers, right? So fibers, there are many, but in paper, that would be most of the building blocks. But there are other additives that I have mentioned, you know, uh, in the previous slide, fillers, they can be up to 30%. Adding too many, too much of fillers is uh, damaging because in general, the more mineral particles you add, the less the RBA. Now you are experts on this. The relative bonded area will be reduced, bonding will be reduced, and mechanical strength will be reduced. So you add, you add fillers for given purposes, but you cannot add too much, and these are the limits. There are ways to increase this by using nanocellulose, by the way, but this is the standard paper making. Starches and, and uh, internal starches and uh, surface additives, of course, uh, these are very important. 
In fact, I, I created this um, a slide long time ago and, and, and I, I found it uh, yesterday and I put it added here. If you think about uh, paper making, uh, here you can see you have a lot of residual material from the potting processes. So no matter what you do with the fiber suspension, they, you will be always facing the fact that you have small molecules dissolved uh, together with the fiber. So there is a little bit of that. There are chemical additives. Here there is a list. And there are also <clears throat> uh, many other components that are carried over in the, the process. So really, when we talk about paper making, it's not only fibers. There is also air, particles, fines, surfactants, sizing agents, polymers, um, extractives. And one thing here, big business, biolog biological organisms that also grow there. So imagine this, this is also a slide that I put, uh, you know, uh, 2005. <laughs> uh, paper making additives, you can see this on list. And uh, this is a, a handbook that I saw at that time. Uh, here you can find 5,800 trade names and products. So, but the basic ones are shown here that I have this course. So paper making is a little bit more complicated than, than only fibers. So my, my last, a uh, set of slides is just a, a, a fun thing that we put together. That was uh, uh, Martin Huvey uh, with me. We put these illustrations, and this is based on a on a on a material that was uh, you know uh, published by Tapi. But we changed it completely. So what you will see here is a little bit the journey that I have uh, explained so far <clears throat> in paper making. Um, question to the group: What is this element here? I will wait for your answer. Anyone who wants to say, is that a fiber, a tracate, or? Exam time. We cannot move on if we don't hear the word, the magical word. It's Vena. Uh, isn't that just a fiber? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, it looks like a fiber, but it's not. Maybe Sara. Sara will nail this down. Is Sara around? I don't know if Sara is still. Uh, uh, either, I mean, a xylem conduit, but either a tracheid or vessel, probably. Yeah. It's a vessel element, right? It's a conduit, right? So <clears throat> this uh, fiber furnish, is it from hardwoods or, or from softwoods? So agreeing that this is a vessel element, it's not a fiber, it's not a tracheid, this webinar, this is a vessel element. Uh, given that, that fact, uh, what is hardwood. the fiber source? Hardwood or softwood? Is it hardwood? Oh, hardwood. yes, hardwood, right? Only hardwoods contain vessel elements. Now, this hardwood is eucalyptus or is, um, is a maple tree or is an eucalyptus tree? You can actually guess that, but we didn't review this. But this, this, uh, this thing here is called a scalary form uh, structure of the vessel. By looking at this, you can identify the three species. So there are many things here. Also, these pits, Sarah is expert on this. She can identify what is the, the three species based on this. And this is a fiber or a tracheid. And typically, as we learn, we have a mixture of softwoods, hardwoods all together, right? And then notice here fibrillation, uh, fibrillation, and we have also fines, right? So this is really the fiber component. But from this slurry of fiber, what is white is water. It's all water. And the scale here is one millimeter. So this is a vessel element, one milliliter long in this particular case. So if we focus here, only here in this uh, red uh, square on the surface of the vessel element that is part of the paper product at the end, you will find that in this vessel element, uh, we have a tenth of the dimension here in red. And you see here that you start to see other things that emerge in the, in the view in the water system. One, polyacrylamides. These are the polymer that is added, right? As a retention agent to help to flocculate materials. So these are polyacrylamides. If we can, if we can see them, it will be this size. And then we have also clay particles and agglomerates. Now, if we go deeper into the distance, so that was 0.1 millimeter, millimeter, let's focus here only 
then you will see this now. You see this, this is Mars, the space. Uh, uh, you know, you find uh, many other things that you never thought before. You have the little part, the tip of the, this tip of the tip of the vessel here, that will be from the wood vessel or wood fibers or fibers, the polyacrylamide in blue. Then you can see, start to see here some green molecules. Uh, I guess some of you can guess what this molecule is. Some are long and stretched, some are branch. These are starches, starches, uh, um, amylose and amylopectin. They are used in paper making. I mentioned that word earlier, so starches. Polyacrylamide, larger molecular weight. Synthetic polymers are usually higher molecular weight than, than natural ones. Here we have amylose. Oh, I saw here the name amylose. That would be amylopectin. Then we see here these uh, round things, um, these round elements, titanium dioxide. That increases um, a, a, a brightness and especially opacity because titanium dioxide has a very high refractive index. So you see that. And then bentonite here, bentonite, right? Um, and, and clay, this is clay, it's not, uh, and kaolin. Amazing, isn't it? And then if we go deeper there, then you see other things. You see the little tip of the fibers, the bentonite and the, the bentonite and the titanium dioxide, the clay flat mineral particles, the amylopectin here, branch starch, and then we start to say, to see nanoscale silica, colloidal silica. So here we're in the one micron vision. So, I mean, this is really amazing uh, if, if you realize it. And if we go even deeper, then uh, we can go even deeper. So I think this is all for today. Paper making is an amazing material. And if you think about it, uh, you know, I forgot about it because uh, um, I learned about paper a long time ago at the beginning in my career. Then I went uh, in the, to the dark side. I started to work on polymer physics and polymer chemistry and, and do very cool stuff. And now life brought me back to uh, Vancouver to go back to something where people like Der Dick Derek and others have been working in very basic paper making. So in a, in a way, in a very strange way, I'm finding that the opportunity for plain paper materials is now coming back wood, paper and fiber materials. So it's, it's very nice. Okay, I'm leaving pulp and paper properties for another occasion. I think uh, we could continue this if you wish, but uh, this is all I wanted to say for the time being. So with that, I will stop and maybe we run out of time, but if you have questions, uh, maybe maybe we can have uh, some uh, question and answers. Uh, one, what is alpha? Is when I ask. So in uh, cellulose, we talk about alpha, beta cellulose, Alpha cellulose is a cellulose with very high degree of polymerization and crystallinity. So we tend to talk about uh, those terms. It's not just nowadays, but alpha cellulose is the one that you want to keep when making regenerated cellulose to make, for instance, textile materials. That's Length, the crystallinity? Uh, it has to do with um, the purity and crystallinity of the cellulose. So alpha cellulose is highly pure and more crystalline. Um, there is also beta cellulose. <clears throat> um, okay, Johan had to uh, run. Uh, okay, and then, yeah, thank you for the comments. Any questions? Uh, I had a couple questions. Um, I guess the first was, uh, can you make a paper out of bacterial cellulose? Uh, I have a student doing that. Uh, this is a beautiful opportunity. Bacterial cellulose makes biofilms. The biofilms are at the nanoscale. And those biofilms can be made into two-dimensional films that we have been using as membranes for separation. So the short answer is yes. And we have a whole uh, you know, set of activities around bacterial cellulose. If you want to work on that, let me know. Uh, we're doing something called biofabrication, where we use bacterial cellulose to do the same that we do with paper making, but using bacteria. And this is part of the trends of using synthetic biology to make materials uh, driven by biology. And this is a beautiful area. Thank you. Um, and I guess for the uh, paper making machine, I, maybe I'm not envisioning it quite right, but for the feed channel, 
um, for the fiber feed channel, can you have multiple feed channels going in to making the paper? Uh, so uh, in the in the head box, you mean, right? Yes. Yeah. So this is a lot of engineering, Sarah. I, I think you are a chemist, right? <laughs> uh, uh, material scientist. Okay. So in engineering, think about it. This is a, an important question. When you make paper, you are pumping in the fan pump, you are pumping paper, uh, fibers in a cylindrical pipe. That cylindrical, cylindrical pipe shape needs to be ending into a two-dimensional material that is paper, right? So that means that the distribution of the fibers at the end has to be very uniform on the running belt of the wet end of the paper machine. And this is a big problem in engineering. Uh, you cannot do that unless you use manifolds or distributors that feed the fiber slurry into the running belt in a uniform way so that the, um, the flux of the suspension and the pressure is equal across the running belt. I'm giving you very engineering terms, but the point is that you need to do that. And for that, you use a, a nozzle. There are multiple nozzles across the running belt to have a very uniform structure form. Then the other question is, maybe that's also what you were thinking, is that you can have uh, two head box at the same time. So this is a dual former. You make paper on a single former, but you can add to the process an, an additional former in such a way that you have a bi-layer, a two-layer structure. Uh, that's a very cool concept, and it's used in industry. Okay, yeah, that's actually what I was thinking about. And then I was wondering if you could adjust the tension on each of the two layers so that you kind of like what I was talking about with the pine cones or something, you have uh, an imbalance so you could maybe have a structural change. I love your question because that's exactly what you get in uh, layer structures. When you have a different um, uh, elastic modulus in two layers that are next to each other, upon drying or upon any changes uh, will produce wrinkling. And I think this is what you are thinking. So absolutely, yes. You can produce wrinkling by many different processes and, and approaches uh, uh, using mechanical means, but in the fabrication aspect or in the fabrication side, you can do that by putting um, two different layers with different mechanical properties, different elastic modulus that will drive um, an isotropy in the seed direction that also will drive upon drying and other things will drive will drive to wrinkling phenomena and also deformation uh, in the way that you are thinking, for instance, with humidity. So the answer is yes, 100%. Yeah, thanks. And this is the last question I have. Um, there was a figure really early on that you had where um, it looked like the uh, pit had actually been separated from the conduits in the figure. And I was curious if there's actually a process already for doing that or if that was more of a theoretical image. <clears throat> no, it's, it's a process because, well, it's a refining, but you have no control on the refining. So the, the separation of the primary wall will happen. You have no control, will happen randomly. And then you will see fractions of pits and, and uh, segments uh, uh, floating around. But it's, it's very difficult to separate those. Uh, if you find a way to separate pits uh, or those uh, primary wall elements from the fiber suspension and you can do a little bit of fines engineering, it will be lovely. And I think in industry, they are looking into this. This is a really very attractive area. I'm very attracted to fines engineering. This is better than nanocellulose. Forget nanocellulose. Fines engineering is an amazing opportunity. Okay, thanks. There are Maybe questions here, Richard? Yeah, Richard is excited as I am uh, with paper making. <laughs> that's good. Any I, other I have a question if that's okay. Sure, Barbara, of course, 100%. Um, I was just wondering, because I've heard you say before that the, um, you can only recycle paper so many times in the process. Um, and is it, is it got to do, is one of the factors got to do with the level of fines that every time you recycle, the, the f level of fines increases. And then if you're making paper with that recycled paper as part of it, that at some point you get to a stage where the water retention is too high? 
Yeah, that's 100% right. If you recycle more, you, you, you fibrillate and refine more with every cycle, you generate more fines and that will uh, uh, re reduce the ability to make paper because you cannot make paper with fines, right? I mean, you saw, you need L over W, <laughs> you need fibers. So the more fines, the, the higher the water retention and the lower the mechanical properties. Fines are needed. Fines are important to be mixed with fibers, but if you only have fines, you won't have paper. So what you said is right, one component. The other component is also important. It's called hornification. Hornification means the following. When you take fibers, you put it in water and then you dry. Then you put it in water and then you dry every cycle. That put it in water and drying makes the fiber in or makes the cellulose in the fibers to recrystallize, to become uh, stiffer and mm, to be less flexible when you make fibers. So the hornification is something that we want to avoid. So that's those cycles of wetting, re-wetting and drying damage the properties. And we have a whole line of research in this area. <clears throat> when we produce, and this applies to all natural products, when we use a chitin from crabs, uh, one secret that we use in our research is that those crabs are used to produce chitin, but we never dry the crab. We use it always uh, in the wet state. And the reason is that if you dry the material, you are already promoting this type of recrystallization processes or ornification like uh, processes that happens with paper. All to say that um, we want to avoid those cycles of uh, uh, wetting and drying. They don't help. Uh, uh, one, one other question I had is just as a microbiologist in terms of separating the different um, uh, elements from from breaking up the, the original uh, source, yeah. uh, fiber source, my thoughts turn immediately to differential centrifugation. Is it just that that, is it that that won't separate these? Yeah, that, that's very, or is it just too expensive for no, it's, uh, a paper It's too expensive process? and too difficult because the difference in density is very small, but they use a similar process uh, compared to that. They, they in in in, um, in grass and in Austria, at least I have seen, but uh, there are patents on this. And in Canada, maybe there is some work in this. They make uh, like hoses or big tubes in circular shape. And these big circles then, uh, uh, or tubes uh, uh, carry out the suspension. And during that centrifugal um, uh, fields uh, that are created, you can eventually have a separation by size. So that's a method to separate fines. But people are looking into this, it's a big, big uh, or important problem to tackle, how to separate fines from sizes. Uh, I mean, uh, material from different sizes, that's, that's a challenge. That's a very important topic, I think. But th that's an example uh, of the process that are used. <clears throat> Uh, as far as the microbiology, 100%. So one thing here is using enzymes to control the processes. And this is very well known. The, the challenge with enzymes is that they are very expensive. And remember, paper makers, uh, they are at all costs reducing all expenses. It's, it's, um, it's very challenging. So they cannot afford to put enzymes, even though there are supplies, suppliers of enzymes to paper making processes. People are using enzymes in the paper processes to to um, change um, the mechanical properties and other properties of paper. For instance, there is enzymatic refining. You do the refining not mechanically, but, but using enzymes. That's a process that, that is possible. But again, uh, it has a cost. And paper makers, as Richard knows, don't want to spend too much money in, in these type of things. But they do sometimes when they have a good time. Now we are going through a lean time in Canada and elsewhere, right? So paper makers maybe are not investing too much in this type of things, but there have been times where they have invested a lot in this type of research and it's very fascinating. Okay. Any other question? Okay. Svena, you wanted to ask? I saw you reacting. Oh, no, it was the same question as uh, Barbara, the recycling question. Yeah, it's Vena, uh, but you're a physicist. I don't think you're thinking about microbiology and recycling. <laughs> oh, well, I'm, I'm an engineering physicist, so. <laughs> oh, okay, good. That's Both. good. Yeah. That's great. I hope yeah. we can continue this interaction in this sense. 
So I will stop here. I think this it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. I feel I felt very relaxed. It took me a while to prepare the slides. I have all the material, but you know, it's an old stuff. So I put it this together and I hope you enjoy and we keep the recording and we share it so that you can keep it. Thank you all. See you next time. Thanks a lot, Orlando. Bye-bye.